want to commend the lessons we've heard this evening. We've heard some tremendous lessons, and uh, certainly I'm, I'm honored to be able to speak to you this evening from God's Word. My message tonight is don't quit. Don't quit. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let's make sure this is on. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, the scripture says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, don't quit. I recently read that over 47 million people in the past year quit their jobs in what's being called the Great Resignation. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's wrong to quit your job, but I'm convinced that jobs are not the only things that people are quitting. Some are quitting the church, and there is something wrong with that. And let me be clear, quitting doesn't always look like leaving the church. Leaving the church is never the answer. Severing ourselves from the body of Christ will never result or produce the results that we want in life. And with some of the Christians in Galatia, Paul was amazed, uh, that, not that they had left the church, but he was amazed that they were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. In other words, they had not packed their bags and left the church, but they quit Christ by turning to another gospel. And I want to talk tonight about four ways that some may be quitting uh, without leaving. First of all, when I say don't quit, I mean don't quietly quit. Don't quietly quit. Some people do this in their job. They, they hate their job, but they need their job. They're, doing, they're, they're, not doing, uh, they're not going to the boss and saying, I quit, or they're not leaving the, the, their workplace, but the, maybe they're clocking out early. Maybe we're checking out early. Maybe we're not working as unto the Lord. Colossians 3, verse 23, like we should. We're quietly quitting. Don't do that. We can't be those who quietly quit. There are some who do this in marriage. They haven't left the home. They haven't packed their bags or filed for divorce. They, uh, they haven't told the kids goodbye, but their heart's just not in it. They're spending more time at work or with friends or with uh, hobbies. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with those things. But when the love of the marriage is no longer a reflection of Christ in the church, Ephesians chapter 5, but rather it's more a reflection of two strangers that occasionally bump into each other, there is something wrong with that. You've quietly quit. Don't do that. Be one who will continue to do what you're supposed to do, to be faithful. There are some who do this in life. There are some who do this in, in the church. They haven't left the church. They haven't gone off the deep end. They still believe uh, in the truth. They still assemble with the church, but their heart's just not in it. Maybe you're going through the motions. Maybe you sing the songs, but you don't sing with heart and voice, as we're commanded in Ephesians 5, verse 19. Maybe we thrum, uh, thumb through the songbook during the lesson. We put on our Christian mask from time to time, a few times a week, and then when we get home, we take it off throughout the rest of the week because we've lost our zeal and we're no longer on fire for the Lord. Listen, Jesus says in Revelation 3, verse 15, I know your works. He says that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were, you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus is saying you've quietly quit. He's saying that you're not doing what I expect you to do. You're not on fire for me anymore you're also not cold. You haven't left. You've just quietly quit. Don't do that. Number two this evening, don't underestimate. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Don't underestimate what, the way that God can use you. I think about Moses in this. You remember when God told Moses in Exodus 3 verse 10, he says, come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. In other words, he was sending Moses to cry out before Pharaoh, let my people go. You remember Moses' response to that? It wasn't, here I am, Lord, send me. He did what we sometimes do. He underestimated what God could do through him. In fact, you remember in Exodus 4, verse 10, he says, I'm not eloquent. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. I, I don't have a, the, the mouth, I don't have the voice, I don't have the ability to go and proclaim this great command to let, my, let your people go. He doubted, he underestimated what God could do through him. He's saying, I don't have what it takes. Have you ever said that? Have you ever doubted what God can do through you? Underestimated what God can do through you? You remember God's response in verse 11? 
God asks this question of Moses. He says, who has made my mouth? In other words, God knows what he's doing. And God has put the abilities that, God, that he needed in Moses. He put those abilities there. He's done the same for you and I. For us, God has given us the abilities that we need. He created you with the talents and the abilities that you have to accomplish his good will. Don't underestimate that. There are things that we say to ourselves sometimes, like I'm not the best speaker. I can't always gather my thoughts and communicate effectively. I don't have the best reputation. I haven't had the best past. I don't have the best Bible knowledge. They won't listen to me. And all these things may be true. But we use them oftentimes as excuses to underestimate what God can do through us. We may have obstacles that get in our way, but remember that Paul had this thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And listen to the Lord's response to this. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul's response to this was not to continue to underestimate his ability or to take this obstacle, this thorn in the flesh and say, I can't move forward. I can't do the work. I can't be involved. No, he says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes the very things that we try to use as excuses, God can use for his glory. I'm not suggesting that we, we be overconfident or reckless in the work of the church, but let's not sell ourselves short and hinder the work by quitting, by underestimating what God can do through us. Listen, young people, don't say I'm too young. Don't say that I can't do it. No, learn, grow, work. You remember what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. He says, let no one despise your youth. Young people would do well to learn that. Sometimes we get in our mind when we're young, yeah, I, I still have some learning to do. I can't get involved with the work. I can't do this or I can't do... We make all kinds of excuses. Don't do that. Don't let anyone despise your youth. But be an example of the, to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. There are things that you can do. Sisters, sometimes you look at your position in life and you underestimate what you can do and the influence you have. Don't do that. You remember the source of Timothy's faith was his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. And Paul says that because of this, there's faith in you. Sisters, you have a great influence and a great ability. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. In fact, remember what Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 3, about the women that helped him. He says, I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with the rest of my fellow workers. What does he call them? He calls them fellow workers. Sisters, don't ever underestimate what God can do through you. Now, I realize that you may not uh, be one who stands up and, and publicly proclaims the gospel in the pulpit. That's not your role. That's not your place. But there is a work that you can do. Don't underestimate that. The, the influence of a godly mother who has a young child on her knees and teaches them the gospel, I guarantee there are some preachers here tonight that are only here because of that. Don't underestimate the, work, the, the workmanship that you can do in Christ, whose names are in the book of life, Paul says, Philippians 4, verse 3. I want all of us to know that we're necessary. We're necessary. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22, Paul says again, no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Number three this evening, don't ignore. Don't ignore what's important. Or to use a biblical phrase, seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 33, when we seek something, we ignore other things. But don't ignore the most important things. When you're driving down the road at 70 miles an hour, there are some things that we naturally ignore. But what happens when we pay too much attention to the wrong things? When we're on our cell phone or when we're uh, paying attention to the, to the flowers in the ditch or when we're uh, rubbernecking and watching a wreck on the side of the road, we're ignoring what's most important and bad things can happen. We've got to make sure that we focus on the right things. Don't ignore what's most important. 
When we focus on the wrong things, we quit focusing on the right things and we neglect them by ignoring them. You remember in the, the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, of course, the, the seed is the Word of God, and it, it lands on various soils. One's the good ground, and there's also the thorny ground. Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, in verse 14, uh, verse 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out, uh, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. In other words, they, they begin to focus on the wrong things, and they ignore what's most important. Sometimes in life we do this. We get caught up with the cares of life, the riches and the pleasures of life. And unfortunately for some, we bring no fruit to maturity. It's not enough for us just to hear the word. I mean, the seed fell on this ground. It was in this heart. But it was choked out because they begin to ignore what's most important. They focus on the wrong things, on everything else. It's not enough to just hear the word. As James says in James 1, verse 22, we have to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Sometimes we get distracted in life, don't we? There are things that, that vie for our attention, and we do tend sometimes to ignore the, the, the things we should be paying attention to. We get distracted. You know that word distraction actually is an old French word. It comes from, uh, uh, the, comes from a torture form that they used to use. The, to, to, be, to be distracted was to take a, 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 a subject and to tie their four limbs to four horses and to slowly pull their body apart, painful and torturous, until they were pulled apart, until they were distracted. Sometimes whenever we pay attention to the wrong things, we focus on cares of this life, we focus on all the wrong things, our lives are just pulled apart. And we wonder why. We wonder why things are so turned upside down. Because sometimes we ignore what we should be focusing on. When we're too busy with life, too distracted by everything that's going on with the economy, with inflation, when circumstances overwhelm us, when our enemies steal our focus from what's most important, the work for the Lord is interrupted and we effectively quit. Don't do that. Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. We've got to keep our focus on what's right and what's most important. And don't just slightly drift away, staying in the church, but not fully committed, not focused on the right things. He says further in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect? That's, that's us ignoring something that's truly important. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard it? The rhetorical answer, there, or the, this question being rhetorical, the answer is we can't escape. We've got to keep the focus don't quit. Number four, don't tire. Let's see if this thing's going to work. Don't tire. Don't get tired. Don't get weary in doing good. That's what the scripture says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. Paul says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Whenever it comes to doing good, it can be difficult sometimes. Living the Christian life is not always easy. It can be difficult, and we can have things that, that trouble us and, and we struggle with. We face temptations. We have, we're bombarded by all kinds of things that, that, again, will vie for our attention. There are things that, that we should struggle with in life. There are difficulties, and sometimes we come short with money, and sometimes there's diseases, and sometimes there's all kinds of things that will cause us to be weary in this life. Sometimes as preachers, we get weary when we speak to people that we, we know they need to change. They know they need to change but they don't respond to the gospel and they don't change their lives. We become brokenhearted over some of those things. We, we begin to get tired, we get weary, and that's when we have to be reminded we might plant, somebody else might water, but God gives the increase. We have to continue in the work and try to be as tireless as possible, knowing that one day there will be a rest. We've got to not tire. I think about... David's life. We've talked about David several times tonight. And in, I look at all the great things that he did in his life, but there, there was a time in his life, obviously, when there was, where there was trouble. And I think that the trouble really began, if you look at his life, it really began when he got tired. I mean, David had been on the run from Saul for many years. He had been fighting battles. He eventually becomes king, and now he has the stresses of being king and ruling God's nation, the Israelites. 
And he has all these things that are, that are pressing down on him. He has all the pressures of life. He has all the difficulties. And at a time in 2 Samuel 11, when he should have been off fighting a battle, you remember where he finds himself on the king's roof. And he lusts after Bathsheba. That momentary relief was, was his ruin. He commits a sin, which then leads to another sin, which then leads to another sin. For David, being tired in that moment of relief seems to have been his ruin. And I know that quitting would pr provide a momentary relief for us. But you have to learn to look past the difficulties in life and see the benefits. To see the benefits of, of remaining faithful, of staying engaged. Notice in Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5, the, the psalmist says, bless, his, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your, that your youth is renewed like the eagles? It should encourage us to look at all the benefits that we have in Christ. One of the benefits we have in Christ that one of the brethren talked about this evening is having those we can go and we can confess our faults to. Another is having someone that, that will help bear our burdens in times of weariness. And you know, I know this is difficult. This is a hard lesson for us to learn. Uh, you know, we are the kind of people who want to do it ourselves. We want to be those who, who have it all figured out and, and we really don't want to trouble anybody. We don't want to burden anybody. But let me tell you, let's learn the lesson to accept help. Don't quit. Accept help. Or, or even better, become the kind of person that wants to help others and bear their burdens. Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Thank God that we have the blessing of brothers and sisters in Christ who will help bear our burdens in times of weariness. So that when we start to get tired, we can have someone build us up and encourage us Help us stand strong and remain faithful. Think about all those in Hebrews chapter 11 who acted by faith and didn't quit. And we can't, of course, talk about them all. In fact, the writer seems to not have been able to because he says in verse 32, and what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also David and Samuel, the prophets, and there are many more when you look at Hebrews 11. And it helps us to look at them and see the example of their tireless work. They struggled. They had all kinds of difficulties. They had all kinds of obstacles, and yet they continued on and remained faithful. They walked by faith, and so should we. Ultimately, think of Jesus. In the garden, he prayed, let this cup pass for me, but he didn't quit. He could have called legions of angels, he said, but he didn't quit. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was abused, he was scourged, he was forsaken. And as he struggled to carry his cross up to Golgotha, he accepted help from a man named Simon, but he didn't quit. And crucified there, suspended between heaven and earth, bleeding in agony for your sins and for mine. He says in John 19, verse 30, it is finished. But he didn't quit. You remember that he was buried and he arose from the dead so that we can be saved, so that we would give him our life and be faithful unto death, so that we would not quit. Don't quit. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 2, maybe I don't have that one up here. The scripture says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Remember Jesus, don't quit. When we think about what he endured for us, we ought to be encouraged to remain faithful. And so my lesson this evening is don't quit, don't quietly quit. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Don't ignore what's most important. Don't tire and grow weary. We want to be those who don't quit. We want to be those who are, remain faithful in times of difficulty and end when it's easy. Don't quit. We have to per persevere, as Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 6, to add to our faith all these different Christian graces, virtues, and, and brotherly loving, brotherly kinds. We, we need to add to our faith perseverance. That's that kind of spirit, that kind of mind that's not going to give up, not going to quit. 
Because it's not, a race, it's not a race of who finishes first, but who finishes. And that makes all the difference. In 2 Timothy chapter, there's the verse I was looking for earlier, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, Paul says. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so this evening, don't quit. As a Christian, maybe there have been things that have really gotten in your way and led to you quitting. Maybe you've not left altogether. Maybe you're here, but in some way you've quit. Don't do that. Come back. Repent of your sins. Confess your faults. And we'll pray with you and for you as a brother or sister in Christ. It's a great blessing, a great privilege that we have. Or as one who's not a Christian, tonight is the time to start. And then when you get started, don't quit. You start by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized this very night for the remission of your sins. If there's one of either way, won't you come while we stand?